Hello, welcome to the Marsha Joyner Show. I know uh, you're wondering where in the world is Marsha? Uh, Marsha is a little under the weather. She called me today and asked me if I'd fill in for her. I am Nick Hood, <clears throat> Pastor Nick Hood in Detroit, Michigan. I am a cousin to Marsha. Uh, our fathers were brothers. Uh, they were in uh, a group of siblings of eight and uh, her father was near the eldest, I think the second oldest. My father was the youngest. My father loved her father so much, he named my brother after Marcia's father, which is Marshall, Marcia. And uh, when Marcia called me today, she asked me if I would be willing to talk about Thanksgiving. And I said, well, what do you want me to say? She said, well, you'll know what to say. You just talk about Thanksgiving. And so here I am tonight. I'm in Detroit. Uh, I assume most of the people who look at this show are in Hawaii. And uh, so I hope you're not too disappointed. But let me step my way into Thanksgiving. And first of all, I think it might be appropriate if I told you a little bit more about myself. Who am I? My name is Nick Hood, Pastor Nicholas Hood III. I pastor the Plymouth United Church of Christ in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I'm in my 35th year as pastor, uh, my 44th year as an ordained minister. And I've only really gotten to know Marcia during the pandemic. It's one of the delights of the pandemic. Uh, she called me out of the blue one day and at first I thought it was a crank call, but she said, no, I'm real, I'm your cousin. And she knew about me. She uh, was very fond of my father when she was a little girl. My father had scoliosis. And uh, in his last year of high school, first year of college, uh, first year to go to college, he actually was in a body cast for the whole year. And my dad was so grateful uh, to the doctors who had straightened his back out, he thought he would become a doctor. But as it turned out, um, when he went to Purdue, uh, Purdue University, at Purdue, there was a minister there, a white minister, uh, who had a missionary spirit. And this white missionary uh, spirit, uh, you know, he, he suffered, the way my dad described it, because he and his wife had opened up their home to, I think, four or five uh, African-Americans in West Lafayette, Indiana. And prior to that, uh, African-Americans were forbidden from living in that part of town. And so this uh, minister uh, was so courageous, he put really his life and his house on the line, his wife on the line. And uh, as it turned out, he and his wife got run out of town. And, uh, and they never came back. But it really made an impression on my father. And my father said, you know, I've never seen white people suffer uh, for black people. And he said, I think I'm gonna give my life to Christ. I'm gonna give my life to the Lord because I want the kind of faith that that man had. And he said, I had never seen a white person with that kind of faith. So my father went on to become a minister and some 29 years later, uh, I was born. He, he married my mother. And, uh, and so I worked with my dad uh, my first eight years of ministry. And uh, then in the ninth year, my dad uh, decided that he had had enough of it. He said, I think I've been here too long. And he walked out of a deacon meeting. He said, I resign. And at that point, I'm looking at my life and saying, well, what do I do now? My wife, uh, who was a lawyer at the time, was elected as a judge. And, uh, you know, not everybody can be a judge. And I said, that would be a, just a heartless and cruel and selfish thing if I just picked up and decided that I would go around the country or go to some other church. I said, I need to just settle down, be right here in Detroit, and that's what I'll do. And so I stayed here in Detroit, and uh, the church, two years later, made me the pastor. So now I'm in my 35th year 
as pastor of the Plymouth United Church of Christ in Detroit. And I'm here today talking with you about Thanksgiving. When Marsha Joyner, my cousin, asked me to talk about Thanksgiving, uh, she said, I said, well, what, what do you want me to say? And she said, oh, you'll, you'll figure it out. Just say something about Thanksgiving. So I hope I'm not uh, torturing you tonight, but I want to talk with you about Thanksgiving. To me, <clears throat> uh, regardless of whether or not you believe the uh, ancient lore about the first Thanksgiving in America with the pilgrims and the in Native Americans and all of that, um, there's a bigger issue. And the bigger issue is, why would a person give thanks? Some people, if you uh, ask them uh, around the Thanksgiving table, what are you thankful for? Somebody, I bet you, will say, uh, thankful for what? You know, I don't have enough money. Uh, my health is not good. I can't see, I can't hear. Uh, the important relationships in my life uh, have, have been fractured. What am I to be thankful for? Uh, and, you know, I can understand why a person might feel that way. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, there was a survey done that showed that uh, something like 49% of Americans, and that includes Hawaii, 49% of Americans, if they were in an emergency, could not come up with $450 uh, cash. They couldn't come up with it. And, uh, and so the question is, I bet you somebody looking at this tonight is in that 49%. And if you're in that 49% that would be devastated by a $450 emergency, you might very well respond if somebody said, what are, or raise the question, what are you thankful for this year? You might say, for what? You know, I, I don't feel good about my life. Uh, I don't feel good about uh, my opportunities. I don't feel good about the choices that I've made. And I'm not particularly thankful for anything. And so to give thanks, uh, I think really it, it requires something more than a simple kind of goodwill. To me, true thanksgiving uh, recognizes that there's someone or something bigger than you, bigger than your life. Something is bigger than you. And because you realize that if it were not for the help of somebody or something, uh, you would not have the quality of life that you have right now. And, you know, when I think about that, I think about, uh, you know, for the Christian, we take it one step further. The Christian takes it one step further and says, I am thankful because I believe that God Almighty, through Jesus Christ, has given me opportunity. It is God who has helped to make my life the life that it is. Uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, 28th verse, says, uh, All things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. All things, not some things but all things. And if all things work together for good, then uh, I am going to give thanks to God because I know it is God who makes all things possible. I know a minister, he's dead now, Obi Matthews, but years ago, Obi Matthews uh, in Detroit, uh, to, he was with a ministers, a group of ministers, pastors meeting. And you know, he was just out of sorts. And so I asked him, I said, Obi, uh, what's troubling you? He said, man, you know, I was on my way to this meeting and I got a flat tire. And so he said, I cheerfully got out of my car and I went to change the tire. And then once I got the tire changed, he said, I got back in the car and kept driving down the street. But as I drove down the street a little while longer, I got another flat tire. And he said, I kept telling myself that Obi, all things work together for good for those who love God. He said, but God, I don't understand why I have to have not one, but two flat tires. Uh, but he said, but I keep telling myself there 
has to be something good in all of this. Uh, I was not particularly crazy about Ronald Reagan as president of the United States, but one of the things I like about Reagan is that evidently he had a good sense of humor and he was very optimistic. And one of the things he did when the stock market was and the economy was at its lowest, when he first became president, uh, that President Reagan would gather his cabinet together. You may have noticed Joseph Biden, the president-elect, is starting to gather his cabinet together. Well, the story, according to Reagan legend, uh, of him being an optimist is that he gathered his cabinet together and he'd look at them and he'd say, are you an optimist or, or, you, or are you a pessimist? And then he would tell a story. And the story went something like this. A young couple gave birth uh, to twin boys. One was very outgoing and energetic and enthusiastic. The other one was quite despondent and, and depressed. <clears throat> and increasingly, the mother and the father became concerned about the mental outlook of the child who was depressed. So they made an appointment with a psychologist and uh, the psychologist happened uh, to you know, have an office that was located in a barn and uh, on a farm. And so they go to this farm-like setting and they take both boys. They didn't want the one child to feel like uh, because he was despondent and, and depressed that uh, they loved him less uh, and were gonna treat him different. So what they did was uh, they brought both boys to the psychologist. The psychologist took the first son, the one who was uh, cheerful, happy, and enthusiastic, and he said, you know, just sit here for a while and I'll be back. He just left him in the barn. The other boy, uh, who was despondent and depressed, he took to a little room that he had outfitted with every kind of imaginable toy. And the psychologist looked at the little boy and he said, son, you can play with all of these toys and you could even have one. Pick the one that you like best. And so the little boy who is looking in the room with all the toys, he becomes concerned and, and fidgeting and he's anxious. And the psychologist looks at him and he says, what's wrong? And the little boy replied, I'm afraid that I might break one of these toys. They all look so nice. I don't want to touch them. And so the psychologist told him, well, son, just let, stay here for a little longer and I'll be right back. And so then the psychologist went down the barn to where the happy boy was and he looked at him and to his amazement and, and surprise, the little boy was shoveling a big pile of manure with his, his naked hands. He put his hands in the manure and he was just shoveling uh, this pile of horse manure. And the psychologist became quite upset and he said, son, what is your problem? Oh my God, why are you doing this? And the little boy was so cheerful, he turned around and he looked at the psychologist and he said, you know, I figure that with a pile of manure like this, surely there's got to be a pony somewhere. And, you know, I look at life like that. Uh, for me, uh, I, you know, I've had my share of piles of manure in life, but I just keep digging because I keep telling myself there's got to be a pony somewhere. And you know, and because of that, I'm able to give thanks uh, because I have that attitude that there's got to be a pony somewhere. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, my life hadn't been a crystal staircase. I've had my share of defeats. I've had my share of successes. But through it all, I thank God. And I thank God because I keep like that little boy digging through the pile of manure. And, you know, life can seem like a pile of manure. But I keep digging through that pile because I say, surely there's got to be a pony somewhere. And so let me tell you a little bit more about my thoughts of Thanksgiving. And so, you know, I think about, um, you know, this Thanksgiving, one of the things that I'm grateful for, believe it or not, uh, are the things that didn't happen the way I wanted them to. Uh, the disappointments in life. I don't know if Marsha Joyner has told you, but 
even though I'm a pastor of a church, I spent eight years at elect, as an elected member of the Detroit City Council. It was a wonderful experience, uh, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, but it takes a lot to get elected. And, and then after I, you know, I was elected for two terms as a city councilman, I ran for mayor, and I lost. Uh, and then about eight years later, I ran for mayor again of Detroit, and I lost. And, you know, to lose in a political election is a hard experience. I mean, we're seeing that right now in President Trump. He's having a hard time acknowledging that he lost. But uh, I think for psychological health and well-being, uh, it's very important to accept your victories and your losses. But for me, I actually, uh, this Thanksgiving, I thank God for the victories. I thank God for the losses. You know, when I lost running for mayor, it helped me to come back to the church. I never left the church, but to focus more on my ministry at the church. And uh, this has been a wonderful experience. I'm here tonight in my office uh, at the church. And, you know, I helped to shape this office. And every time I come in this office, I think about how nice this office is. But you know, the funny thing about the ministry is you can be so busy as a minister that uh, it's very difficult to just spend time. I can't remember spending a whole day in this office because the Lord has me running to and fro. Um, I'm looking at my watch because I want to make sure that uh, I don't run over the time limit. But um, for me, this Thanksgiving is a Thanksgiving where I will give thanks to God for my victories. I will give thanks to God for my losses. I thank God. I think about the women I've loved in life before I got married. And I've been married 44 years. Uh, and they were all nice women, but I thank God I didn't marry any of them. More because I think I probably would make them sad. I think they would have a difficult time being married to a minister with all the vicissitudes, all the changes, uh, the erratic time frame that ministers operate under. And I think I just would have broken one of their hearts uh, with that. But I thank God uh, for those experiences. Uh, I thank God uh, for the people that I've met. I thank God for the experiences. One of the things you may not know about me is uh, I didn't always want to be a minister. I wanted to be an R and B musician. I was a musician and that's what I did. I played music and I loved music and I did, I played music until I was 21. Uh, but you know, and I don't want to go through the whole thought process that, uh, led me away from the music. But let me just say this, that, uh, I was very disappointed, uh, when my musical career ended and I felt that you know, I had set some benchmarks for myself. I said, I think I can't keep doing this. And so for me, the ministry was actually a fallback career. Uh, I love the ministry. I uh, have a lot of regard for the ministry, but I knew in my heart that uh, the ministry was something I could do until the day I died. And so that's what I'm doing right now. Now, uh, I have been thinking leading up to this Thanksgiving, uh, what is it that I'm so thankful for this Thanksgiving? One of the things I'm thankful for, as I just mentioned to you, I'm thankful for the disappointments in life because the disappointments that I've experienced have helped me to further clarify and further define my values and my principles. And I'm a much clearer person right now uh, because of the, the losses the disappointments in life. Uh, I thank God, uh, but also for the successes. And uh, I was trying to give a chronology of them the other day, but I'm very grateful. I am 69 years old in October. I just turned 69. And uh, I've been thinking about it. I said, you know, Nick, you got to step on the gas because in another 31 years, you'll be 100 years of age. It's hard for me to imagine that. Uh, but you know what? I thank God my fingers don't tremble. I thank God my eyes don't twitch. I thank God that my ears can still hear. I thank God that my tongue does not cleave to the roof of my mouth and that my right arm has not lost its cutting. I thank God 
for all that I can walk. I thank God that I can talk. I thank God for all the places I've been, the people I've known, uh, the things that I've done. Uh, I have had a wonderful life and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I think about some of the places where I've been, some of those places where I've been are places I'm not sure I want to go there right now. I went with my denomination in 2010 to the, to the Democratic Republic of Congo and then the Republic of Congo. And, you know, I got out alive. Uh, you know, it was dangerous there. In 1997, I led a small delegation to Cote d'Ivoire, also known as the Ivory Coast, because one of my church members had a tribe from Liberia and they were refugees of war. And so we went there with about $15,000 worth of money we had raised at church and about an equal amount of money that, uh, in terms of medicine that was given to us through the Detroit Medical Center in Detroit. Uh, you have to remember, I was a city councilman then uh, during those years, <laughs> but uh, they gave us a lot of money. And, uh, and then in 1999, we recreated that trip. Uh, and in the 1999 trip, I took my 12-year-old and my 16-year-old uh, son because I wanted them to see what does their dad do when he's not in the pulpit of the church. And so that was 97, 99, 2010. I was in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In uh, 2002, uh, I went with a group of preachers and rabbis to Israel uh, and then in about 2006, I went back to Israel with APAC, uh, and those were free trips. Some of my Palestinian friends asked me, why are you doing this now? And I said, because the trip was free and I wanted to go. I, I'm a Christian. I wanted to go to the Mecca of Christianity, which is Jerusalem. I wanted to see it for myself. But I tell you, I've been in 2005 to Sierra Leone, 2006 to Ethiopia. And between, I think, 2006 and 2012, I've been to Ethiopia four times as part of a medical mission uh, that my church sponsors. Uh, in 2012, uh, I led a church trip to South Africa. Uh, in 2012 or 13, my wife and I spent three weeks in Dumaguete City of the Philippines teaching at Silliman University. A tremendous experience. I don't know when I would be able to go back and experience that kind of trip. And then since then, you know, we've been running church trips. In 2009, uh, I took a delegation to Egypt. Uh, and uh, I told you about the South Africa trip in 2012. 2014, I had a delegation to go to Ghana. Uh, and then from there, we went to Greece and Rome in a trip called Following the Footsteps of Paul, and uh, then on to back to Israel, but a church trip. And these have been tremendous experiences. And so as I get ready for this Thanksgiving, I'm gonna tell you, I'm a very grateful person uh, because I don't know when, and you know, we're in a pandemic now. And so I thank God that I had the wisdom when I was younger to take the kind of trips that I've taken. Uh, we even went to Hawaii, my wife and I, uh, as part of an official delegation of the United Church of Christ. And uh, we were there, some of you looking at this, I know these many of the viewers in this program uh, are residents of Hawaii. Well, we went to Hawaii with the National Church of the United Church of Christ for guess what? To apologize for the complicity of the predecessor church to the United Church of Christ, the Congregational Church. I know there's still some congregational churches in Hawaii. And the complicity of the Congregational Church in the overthrow of Queen Lily, do you, do you pronounce her name? Lily Ukulani. And uh, I looked at pictures of her. I said, she looks like she could be one of my aunts. She had nappy hair. She was a big woman. She had rather big lips and a big posterior. And I looked at that and I said, if I didn't know better, Lily Okulani has some blood in her. And uh, one of the things that we learned, we were, and I said, this seems odd. I said, we're here apologizing for the complicity of the congregational church. I said, look, 
My great grand great great grandfather was a white man, a slave owner named William Branch uh, Hood, who was the brother of John Bell Hood, Colonel John Bell Hood, uh, the youngest of the Confederate generals. And I said, my great grandfather, Nicholas I, was a runaway slave. Uh, and so I said, how, what kind of sense does that make that now I'm here apologizing for something I didn't have anything to do uh, with? But, um, you know, there it is. But one of the things that really touched me about Queen Lily Ukulani, they, they told us that she, she was hemmed in uh, in her palace and uh, Dole and maybe other business people, the Dole Plantation, uh, really pushed for her overthrow, even though uh, President Grover Cleveland, uh, you know, said he supported her. But the reality is, she was overthrown as the queen. And she wrote this song, and I took it back to Detroit. I said, I'm going to have my church sing this. But uh, they, some people call it the queen's prayer. Your loving mercy is as high as heaven, and your truth so perfect. I live in sorrow imprisoned. You are my light, your glory my support. Behold not with malevolence the sins of man, but forgive and cleanse. And so, O oh Lord, protect us beneath your wings and let peace be our portion now and forevermore. Amen. Now, I'm concluding with the Queen's Prayer because I began this program tonight talking about the root of Thanksgiving. Some people are just grateful, but the Christian is grateful, the believer in God is grateful because we believe that things don't happen by accident. We believe that God has a hand in our lives. And that, my friends, is really uh, what I want to say to you tonight. Uh, be thankful, be grateful, realize that God is real and that God can make a difference in your life. Uh, I hope that my cousin Marsha Joyner is feeling better. But again, this is Nick Hood. Uh, coming to you live from Detroit, Michigan, and I want you to know uh, we're all in this thing together. Give thanks. God bless.